For today's episode, we are going to put a pause on our money content to share a powerful story. With 2024 quickly approaching, I'm sure you're giving some thought to some changes you'd love to make in your life. It could be that you want to eat healthier, repair a relationship, feel more confident, tap into your true potential, or anything of that sort. But maybe those ideas come with some discouragement. If this is something that you want to change now, it's probably something you've been thinking about changing for a while. I've totally been there. I make these empty promises to myself that quote, quote, next Monday is whenever I'll start. And of course that day comes and for some reason, I'm still acting the same way and not taking action on that promise. 2024 is going to be different for both of us though. No more empty promises. We are going to prove to those who have been doubting us, our parents, our friends, our partners, but most importantly, ourselves. And there is no better story to end our 2023 content with and leave us feeling empowered like my friend, Nate Dukes. This guy has gone through a lot from being a hugely successful business owner to being behind bars getting caught stealing a car. I'll leave his story at that. I don't want to ruin his reinvention story, but this is a great one to play out loud in the car for everyone to hear as you're headed to grandma's house for your holiday celebrations. This story originally aired years ago as episode 41 and has been a fan favorite ever since. This is the last episode of 2023. Thanks for an amazing year. I had so much fun creating content for you in 2023, and I'm even more excited about 2024. As a reminder, moving forward, we'll be publishing bi-weekly on Wednesdays to make some space for some other projects that we have in the works. You'll see our content shift in 2024 to a major focus on money. So if this is the year that you are dedicated to taking control of your finances, be sure to hit that subscribe button. I'm working on February content right now and our guest list is incredible so far. So you're really not gonna wanna miss out. Okay, enough teasing. I hope you guys have an amazing end of the year and a happy holidays. Let's get into the interview. I hope you enjoy my conversation with the inmate turned author, Nate Dukes. You know those moments where you think, I wish I would have learned this in school? Those are the topics that we love to talk about. Join me each week as I interview experts sharing their strategies for solving problems that us young adults will face throughout our 20s and 30s. So what are you waiting for? If you want new episodes about adulting advice every Monday, hit that follow button. I think we need to start in a very traditional place, childhood for you. I yeah. heard you often mention about this Christmas event that happened. Yeah. Um, it seemed like it maybe shaped a little bit of your thought process around your current situation when you were a child. Can you explain what happened on that Christmas and what you learned from that? Yeah, absolutely. Before we go into that, I do have to say, this is an amazing podcast. You've done a really great job. I'm a huge fan of the show. What you're doing is super valuable right now. So thank you so much for having me on. But growing up as a kid, man, I was, we were the poor family. We didn't have a whole lot. My parents, they were, they were really kids trying to raise kids. They had some broken mindsets that were passed down to us. And I don't blame them for anything because they were just trying to figure things out as they went. My mom came up to us one Christmas and she said, hey, just don't plan on having a whole lot of presents underneath the tree this year. And you know, as a kid, that's never really anything that you want to hear. But there was this really great church that came along and they, they bought my mom a bunch of Christmas presents for us. And we had this amazing experience, but we knew it didn't come from her. We had this understanding that this didn't come from them. And so we were used to hand-me-downs and handouts. And, and I'll tell you that as I grew up, I just always felt like my, my childhood was this catalyst of chaos. And everywhere I, I turned and everywhere I went, I just felt like we were never going to have it. We had this poverty mindset, this lack mindset. And so when I turned 18 and I, I really wanted to get away from the chaos of my childhood, I did what any 18-year-old that doesn't know how to live life, I did what they do. I went and I took out a whole bunch of student loan debt and I <laughs> applied for a, a public university. I'll tell you, man, uh, I wanted to escape the chaos of my childhood. So I, I started going to college. I, I started to to really try and better myself. But when I got there, man, I, I was introduced to the, to the, not just college, but also the party scene that comes along with college. And so now I'm experimenting with alcohol and drugs for the very first time. And now the, these two things are starting to compete with each other. And I'm 
I'm falling behind on my studies and I'm feeling like, man, I got to really do something to catch up. And I start taking prescription ADD medication and now I'm hyper-focused and I feel like I'm Superman and I can accomplish anything. And I'll tell you, it started out as a weekend experience in the beginning, turned into a full-blown drug addiction at age 19, 20, and 21. And so after four years of college, I managed to come nowhere close to getting a degree. But I'll tell you, I did have a really good time while I was there. (laughs) But I, I discovered this. What feels good in the moment isn't always good for your future. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, I ended up, I had to move back in with my mom and dad. And for me, that was the real walk of shame. I don't know if anybody's listening has ever had to do the walk of shame before, but moving back in with my parents, that was the real walk of shame for me. And through a series of events, a friend of mine actually approached me and he knew that I had this desire to create, to build, to conquer, to grow. And he invited me on this journey of actually opening up a bar and restaurant in downtown Youngstown with him. And this really touched on a couple of things for me. This touched on the business owner, the entrepreneur that was on the inside of me, but it also touched on this guy who had fallen in love with the party scene. And so uh, we took what was a failing business in the beginning, and we actually turned it into something that was pretty successful over the course of two years. And so now in my life, I have access to more money than I had ever seen. Now, this was not a life-changing amount of money, but you got to understand being the poor kid growing up, to me, it felt like the world. And so now I have a really nice car. I've got a beautiful apartment with high rise ceilings in downtown. I'm in social settings that I would have never had access to before. And I thought that once I had all of this stuff, that I would be happy. That once I got everything that I had ever wanted, that my life would somehow be fulfilled. And I found out that it wasn't. I found out that I got everything that I ever wanted and I was still empty on the inside because it's not stuff that makes you happy. It's who you are as a person. And I was still a very empty person. And so I started to try and fill that emptiness with anything that I could get my hands on. And so the drug addiction really started to ramp up at this point. I'm finding myself going to different casinos and and now I'm gambling and And I'm the classic definition of a bad gambler, right? I will just go and I will lose all of my money and I'll keep going back. And geez, I guess at this point, I wasn't even the the money that I wanted anymore. It's just the high of going to the casino, the ups and the downs. I, I became addicted to that too. It was just as strong as any drug that I had taken. And really, oh, it took about a year, but I ended up losing everything in my personal bank account. I ended up having to sell my car. I got rid of that. And and geez, my, my, my bank accounts were empty, but the business bank accounts, well, they were still full. And so I found myself in this desperate place, starting to move money around a little bit. And I'm taking a, a little bit off the top and I'm, I'm moving things around. And, and I, I guess at that time, I thought to myself, well, well, geez, aren't I the business owner? Isn't this my money anyways? Well, here's the truth. You can't take business money and use it for personal investments. That's actually called embezzlement. And so here I am taking business money, using it to feed a drug and gambling addiction that I developed. And we had several employees who worked for us. And and my business owner, he came up to me on payday and he said, Nate, it's time to cut the checks for everybody. And I just came clean to him in that moment. And I said, listen, if we write these checks, there's not going to be enough money in the accounts to cover them. And you could see the, the frustration and the confusion on his face. And then everything started to catch up to him. He realized that I had taken the payroll money the night before and I had gambled it all away. And so he gives me an ultimatum at this point. He looks at me and he says, Nate, you can sign this thing over to me, this business and walk away free and clear, or I'm going to get lawyers involved and I'm going to press charges. And so at age 26 years old, I signed what was essentially my life's work at that point. I signed it over to another human being and I walked away. And here was the sad part is that my identity was wrapped up in being a business owner. And when I didn't have that anymore, I didn't know who I was. And so I fell into this deep depression and I had to move back in with my parents again. And I could hardly hold down a job. I would get a job as a server at a local restaurant somewhere, but I would revert back to what I knew, which was taking from the cash register. So I take, I get caught, and then I'd get fired. And that happened three different times, actually. And the last time that I had gotten let go from a job, 
I was walking around my parents' apartment complex. It was three o'clock in the morning. I'd just taken a handful of pills and I was walking up to different vehicles to try and see if any of them were unlocked. And I, I was just looking for anything that I can get my hands on to sell or to take, anything that I could feed this addiction that was on the inside of me. And I ended up opening the car door to a 1999 Buick LeSabre. And as I opened up the center console, I pulled out the spare keys to that car. And because apparently that's where you keep the spare keys to a 99 Buick LeSabre. In that moment, I thought to myself, is this a chance to get away? Is this a chance to run away from all of my problems? I don't know if you've ever tried to run away from your problems before, but somehow they have a way of always catching up with us or, or running just as fast as we do because it's not our problems that's the issue. Oftentimes, it's, it's us that's the problem. And so I didn't wake up that morning thinking to myself, well, today's the day that I'm going to steal a car. But when you find yourself in the wrong place with the wrong headspace, you never know what is possible. And so here I am. I packed up five garbage bags of clothes. I load them in the back of this stolen car. And I, I'm heading for Houston, Texas. I know I have a friend down there that said, Nate, if you ever find a way to get down here, I'll help, I'll help you get back on your feet. And so I, I made it halfway um, right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. It was a small town called Ashland City. And I pulled into a gas station where I had just wanted to get some sleep because I'd, I'd been up for three days at that point. And I remember pulling into the gas station, I closed my eyes and I'm woken up to three really loud bangs on the driver's side window. And a stranger's hand reaches in the car, pulls me out, puts me in handcuffs, sets me in the back of a cop car. And I realize in this moment that I'm in trouble. And the weight of every decision that I'd ever made sat on my chest like a ton of bricks. And this thought kept replaying over and over in my mind. It was the same thought that my business partner had told me. It was the same thought that other people that I had taken advantage of told me. But I found that the loudest of voices are the ones that are in our own head. And it was this thought that kept saying, you'll never change. This is who you are. You are never going to change. And they took me to Cheatham County Jail, where I spent six months of my life. And it was a pod style facility. So I shared this pod with 16 guys. There were three tables. There were two toilets. There was one TV, but there were no windows. And the only opportunity that we got to get out was once a month, they offered something called church service. Now, listen, I was not interested in going to church at all, but I was interested in getting out of that pod. And so we walked down this long cinder block hallway and off the left-hand side, there was this room with 16 folding chairs set up. And as we filed in, listen, we were some ugly looking dudes at this point. We, our hair was grown out, our beards were a mess. And as we walk in, this really, really old guy walks in also. And he pulls out this really, really old guitar. And as he's tuning it up, he says to us, he says, fellas, the only difference between me and you is that I never got caught. And he starts to sing this song, Amazing Grace. And it goes, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And dude, I looked around the room and I see 16 guys who, I mean, these were criminals. These were guys who would hurt people. And they had tears streaming down their face. And they were crying. And they were crying hard. They were like, they're like ugly white girl crying, like drunk white girl crying. It's hard to describe this moment, but I wasn't worried about my past, the things that I had done wrong. I wasn't worried about my future. When was I going to get out of here? But this overwhelming sense of peace sat on me and that weight began to actually lift off of my chest. And I just thought to myself, I said, if it is possible to change, I want to, because this is not the life that I want to live anymore. And so when I got out of jail, they gave me a felony theft over 1000 because you are not allowed to steal cars and drive them across the country. But they also gave me two years of probation, which they allowed me to transfer to Ohio. And so when I got back up to Ohio, I got obsessed with trying to figure out how do you create real change in your life? How do you do something? Because I had tried to change before in my past. I would said, I told myself that things are going to be different this time, but I wanted to create real lasting change. And I, I got obsessed with personal development and and I'll tell you, I found a John Maxwell book that said, if you want your world to change, you've got to be the one that changes first. And so I did a deep dive in and 
And how do I become the best version of me in all areas of my life? So I want to become the best version of me emotionally and mentally. I want to become the best version of me spiritually. I want to become the best version of me financially, which was really tough. Still working through a lot of that. I want to become the best version of me physically. I wanted to take control of my health again. And I committed to doing this for one year. I said, I want to take one year and just give it all I've got. Because the truth is, if I wanted to, I could always go back. I could always go back to living the way that I was before. But I didn't know what my life could look like Mm. if I committed one year and said, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And now fast forward from that, my life looks nothing like what it used to. And the cool thing now is that I actually, now that I've made my own comeback, I get this really cool opportunity to help other people create theirs as well. Mm. Nate, thanks for laying out that timeline. I want to put a pin in where you left off there so that we can go back and double click into a few of the moments that you laid out. First, maybe a broad brush of a few different aspects of that. Coming out of college, you know, flunking out of college, actually, having really nothing to show for after four years. Also, this moment when you had to hand over the business. And then these three moments afterwards where you're getting fired because you're stealing. Is there a storyline that you're telling yourself in order to push you through some of those? Or are you thinking to yourself, like, I am a terrible person? Yeah. So I I never contemplated, even when I stole the car, I never contemplated that I would ever get caught or that I would ever get in trouble. I just assumed that I was doing what I had to do in the moment. Hmm. You know, there's something that there's something that happens when you feel like under pressure and I'm squeezed. You really find out what's on the inside, right? When you squeeze an orange, the juice comes out and the juice that was coming out of me. It wasn't good, man. It it was, it was actually to push through a lot of that stuff. I did have this storyline that just said, if you keep going, everything will be okay. If you keep going, everything will be okay. And to an extent, That is true. I actually still use that today. That actually fuels me like when I'm feeling down and I feel like unmotivated. That's super helpful. But if you are using the wrong strategy to get somewhere, I don't care. Listen, if you want to go to New York City, but you live in California and you are headed in the opposite direction, it's going to take you a real long time to circle around the globe to get back to New York, right? So we want to make sure that we have the right strategy in line. And I definitely was using the wrong strategies to be able to create a life that I thought that I wanted. Well, declare it, you were at least unaware. I don't, it didn't seem like you were just intentionally malicious. I mean, in some of the actions that you did, sure. But it was really like this, like afterthought to like, you went to the casino, you thought you were going to be able to pay the business back plus interest. You thought you were you were going to do yourself a favor and the business a favor. Then it all kind of comes crashing down the next yeah. day when payroll's there. Yeah. Really interesting. Because like I said, I, I didn't really pay you for someone that was intentionally being malicious, like knowing that you're just going to blow because you have an addiction. Oh, yeah, yeah. I definitely was never like, I'm going to really try and take advantage of people today. That was <laughs> never a thought that crossed my mind. But I found myself desperate. And when you're desperate enough, you get stupid. And I did some really stupid stuff. Yeah. And then you have this other contradicting side to your personality too, like this like hopeless, ambitious man. You quoted it in your book at some point in time. Like somebody said that you were this thing. I I don't remember if you know the exact verbiage there. And then you like took a day to think about it. And you're like, you know what? I am that. And it has led me to this situation, which is like the fascinating part of your storyline, like getting to see it in retrospect, like you came out of college, you failed and you're like, yeah, that doesn't matter because I'm still going to make something of myself. Go, you start this marketing agency that fails just to pick up another opportunity at this bar. You go, you turn this, this bar around. You're pretty successful after like two years, you got it all fail again. (laughs) You go to jail and then out of jail, you pick things up and, and you're off and running on, on so many different aspects. You're such a fascinating character with a lot of like push-pull paradoxes throughout. Yeah, dude. So I'll tell you, it's been an emotional roller coaster ride to say the least. And I always tell guys who, that I coach, they say, man, I'm really feeling like I'm super down right now in this moment. And they're trying to like create a life that they've always wanted. And I say like people who are trying to experience success, they're not immune to the ups and downs, the emotional roller coaster ride. They've just found a way to push through it. They found a way to overcome it. And so 
I'll tell you, even though that you might hear some passion or some confidence coming through my voice right now, there's still an immense amount of insecurities that I have to face every single day. And I said, that is not who I am. I'm choosing to look past them. The imposter syndrome is a real thing. Anytime you try to create something of significance, you always feel like, I, sh- I don't belong in this room. I shouldn't be here. And I choose to fight past that every single day. It's this dichotomy of hopelessness, like you said, a, a, a real belief in myself that says I can do it. And I'll tell you where that comes from, actually, this belief in myself. So when things were really down and I didn't, I felt like I didn't have anybody in my corner, I had really let, let down everyone around me. I've actually never shared this on a show yet. So this is an exclusive for you. It was my birthday and uh, this was before I had gone to jail. I was sleeping in my parents' basement and it it actually felt like a jail cell because it was a cinder block basement. It was my birthday and I just thought to myself, there is nobody in this world right now that likes me at all. My parents, they, they probably have to love me. There's probably some biological chemical inside of them that says you have to love your son but I'm pretty sure they don't like me either. I've given everybody in this world a reason to do that. That's not their fault. It's mine. And so through all of that, I've actually had to build this relation. I've had to build a relationship with myself where I become my own coach. This is something that I teach a lot of people too, is that you have to learn sometimes when nobody else believes in you yet to learn how to coach yourself because you're the only voice that you have right now. And so the relationship that I have with me is so important because sometimes I'm the only person that I have. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. And I think we're going to get into that here in in a minute. But I do want to flash back to those first few weeks in jail. I'd love to understand what you were feeling in that moment. Uh, Obviously, you never never predicted that you you would be in a jail cell. All of a sudden, you made this decision in one moment. I'm really curious, the first three weeks or so, yeah. What, what was your feeling and what were you thinking? So I will tell you, I was convinced I would never get caught. Even stealing the car, I was like, I will be fine. I even had this like master plan that I had created of how I was going to get rid of the car when I got to Texas. I was convinced in my brain, which is is probably, it's probably a good and a bad thing. It's probably like one of my greatest weaknesses, but also it's like a, it's a deep strength that I have this like belief that I can do anything. But the first week, three weeks of jail were, dude, they were intimidating to say the least. So I was in a country jail where I didn't know anybody. It was a small jail where I felt like everybody kind of knew each other. And it was, and when I got there, you know, you hear these stories or you watch TV, you've got to be super tough and don't let anybody punk you because that's the worst thing that could ever happen. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, man, I got there and I kind of just kept my head down and I kept to myself and I laid low and I stayed out of the way and I stayed out of trouble. And if I got invited to the card table, I would go and play. You try to make conversation. I'll tell you, the greatest currency that you can have in jail is a really great story mm-hmm. because that's all, that's all they got. All I got is time, man. And you're used to seeing the same things over and over again. You look, imagine being in your room right now, like where you sleep every single night. Imagine like just, okay, it's a great room. Probably you probably got some really cool stuff on the wall. You like what you like. You've designed it uniquely for you. Now take all of that away. And then just sit in that for six months. It's just the same space over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. So it's it's very intimidating. It's very dull. It's very boring. And so that's why a really great story, it actually is like, it's it's a currency in there because now you can entertain yourself. You can entertain others. You can help pass the time. And that's the name of the game when you're in jail. How do we pass the time? Because that's all we've got. We've just got time. And so stories go a really long way. Mm. Also, this is a side note. Learning how to use the restroom in front of other people was difficult. Okay, so that might be a little bit of an overshare. And I apologize. I'm not trying to gross anybody out. It's just the reality of the fact. You have no privacy. You are in a situation where everything is always around other people. And so for me, that was super uncomfortable. But I had to figure out how to get over it. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure your first poop or two was was not a fun experience. (laughs) At all. So who's, who's the pod father and how does he get appointed? Oh gosh. It's so it's, that's, that's funny. So you're referring to the term that I use in the book where essentially like in the pod style facilities, like in any kind of social setting, there will always be a leader that rises up just naturally as human beings. We are, we're, we're looking for someone. Okay. Who's in charge here? What are the rules? Who do I look to? 
And so whoever is the, the natural born leader who asserts their dominance usually is the one who's going to rise up as a leader. But every once in a while, there's like this overthrow that happens where the pod father gets dethroned. They get kicked out of the pod. It's this whole situation where everybody rises up and it, t- it takes their authority. They kick them out and the guards have to come in and they remove him for their own safety. It's actually kind of crazy. It's very dangerous. But yeah, I was never the pod father. Now looking back, this is not like a, this is not me oversharing. Like I've developed some really great leadership abilities. One of the things I get to do all the time is leading people. So I think back now, like if I were to go back to jail, what would that experience look like? Because I've actually learned a lot of social skills now on the other side of it. And I think that I would go in with the, with the mindset of just over time, I've just got to slowly figure out how do I become in charge? And then I would like take care of everybody in there. Like you could come to me if you had issues or you had problems or you needed like some extra honey buns or like you were low on shampoo. <laughs> like I would be your, I would, I would be the pod father of the people. Mm. But yeah, so it, essentially to go full circle with it, a natural leader is always going to rise up in social situations. And so either you're a leader or you're a follower. And it's not a bad thing either way. For a long time, I preferred to be a follower. I actually like that. I like following. There's some, a sense of security. There's, there's a, a safety in being a follower. There, there's one dominant person who ultimately will, will, will rise up and become the pod father. <laughs> yeah. And just to put a pin on the experience, because I, I feel like you were done with jail. Like you were going to do everything in your nature not to be back there. You had it six months. I'm done with it. The most heart-wrenching piece of, I think, that whole timeline was whenever you got out of jail in this Walgreens situation that happened. Yeah. Can you share about that? Yeah, absolutely. I I just gotten out of jail. I was in Ashland City, Tennessee. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know anybody there. I was so thankful that my parents were willing to help me out and they wired me some money. And so I go into Walgreens just to go in and uh, is the first experience that I had going into a store. And now you got to understand. So in this situation for the last six months, the way that I had been talked to was like a second class citizen. So I was treated like an inmate because I was. Mm-hmm. And so when I walk into Walgreens, this lady who had no idea who I was, I was wearing a white t-shirt and the black basketball shorts that I had gotten arrested in. And my hair was kind of messed up. And I walked in and this sweet old lady just says, Hey, honey, how can I help you? Mm. And I, it was the first time in six months that somebody treated me with dignity, with respect, but also with a sweetness about them. And I like broke down in tears in that moment because it had been so long since somebody was nice to me. And so now I have a high value on being nice to other people because you never know what somebody's walking through and what they're experiencing in their day to day. So how did you resist temptation? You go back into the real world. Yeah. And I'm assuming you had some friends that were part of your life when you were kind of falling into this debauchery of, of jail and what it was. Did anybody approach you once you got out of jail and, you know, let's get high, let's do these things? So right out of jail, I became a landscaper right away. It was the only job that I could get. I, I worked for this company when I was 19 years old in the summertime just as summer help, when I came home from college, I gave them a call and I said, listen, here's where I'm at. This is what I've done wrong. Do you need any help? And they were so cool about it. They're like, yeah, Nate, like come on board. And so I started working as a landscaper and it was a really great experience. It, It taught me a lot of really cool things, discipline, consistency, but also tell you, man, like sometimes landscapers, I can't speak for all of them, just the ones that I happen to be around. They, they like to party a little bit. And, uh, so you know, I found myself smoking weed and drinking on the weekends. And it, it was so interesting because at this time, I'm also like walking around every single day with earbuds in my ears. And what it started out listening to like whatever playlist that I had. And then over time, it turned into like personal development podcasts or audio books or anything on YouTube that I could find that was really inspiring. And so I'm like smoking weed and listening to Tony Robbins at the exact same time. I'll tell you, I really got obsessed with creating a vision for my future and creating this vision that was so compelling, that was so, so big that I was drawn to it, that it wasn't something that I had to push myself to, but I would wake up every single day excited for it. 
And it was, what's really interesting is that I made the conscious decision that said, you know what? I don't actually want to use alcohol or drugs in this season of my life, not because I'm against all of it, but because it's actually slowing me down. Not because it's the right thing to do, but because I know that if I don't smoke weed, I'm more productive, I'm more effective, I'm more efficient, I operate at a higher RPM, I can get more done, I can communicate more effectively, I'm more passionate, I can connect with people on a human level better instead of running away from all of my emotions. This is not like, I'm not sitting here saying nobody should ever smoke weed ever, or I'm not saying that weed is great. What I'm saying is that for me, I just made that decision not to do it anymore because it was pulling me away from the plan, the purpose, and the destiny that was inside of me. So if you're out there and you you enjoy recreational activities, I have no problem with that. I would just propose to you the vision for your life. Is it so big yet? Is it compelling to you? Is it pulling you forward? And if it is, if you want to get there faster, maybe there are some things that you can say no to today that will actually speed up that process to get you to where you want to go. When did personal development insert yourself after jail? Was that three months, six months? Where was that in the timeline? Yeah, so it was probably about three months right after I got out of jail. So Conor McGregor was getting ready to fight Floyd Mayweather. So arguably one of the best uh, UFC fighters is taking on arguably one of the best boxers of all time. And so they're going to have a boxing match. And they really hyped up this fight. It was really cool for me. I'm really excited for this. And I'll tell you, I was watching the backstory of Conor McGregor. And he's got some ideas on life that are super inspiring. Some of them, I don't know that I fully subscribe to. But as I was listening to it, he talked about how he started from nothing, how he, would, he was a kid from the wrong side of Dublin. Like he was in Ireland. He didn't have a whole lot. But he just had this intense belief in himself that if he just keeps going, he'll be able to create a better life. And that really resonated with me. Well, because he had fruit on the tree from it. So it's not like some guy was standing on the corner and said, if you just believe in yourself, you can have all your dreams come true. This guy was like in the middle of it, getting like he has multiple titles. He has backed up everything that he said. And now, now he's saying it. Like I just had this really intense belief in me. And so for me, that's when I started to say, maybe there is something to this. And then, so that led to different like motivational YouTube videos. And that only carries you so far because the truth is, is that motivation is a drug just like any other. I can get hopped up on motivational speeches all day, but as soon as that motivation wears off, I'm exactly where I was before. So that translated it then into listening to audiobooks and personal development podcasts and and now I'm listening to strategies in combination with the motivation. So I now I have a strategy to create real change. I'm inspired and motivated to do it. And now I've created some momentum in my life. And then the momentum really starts to take off. I've been able to make massive change in months and years instead of taking it decades. Mm. Yeah, and I think another really important thing you did was get around the right people. And Come on, bro. two of those, it seems like it seems like your little sister did ask you a very, very important question that led you down yes. a really great path. And then you also got introduced to this guy named Brad. Would love to know, A, where did your sister bring you? And B, yeah. can you tell me a little bit about Brad? Sure. So uh, I'm fresh out of jail. After six months, you want to do anything. You want to experience life again. And so my little sister, she could have said things like, hey, do you want to go party? Do you want to go to the movies? Whatever she said I was going to do. And she goes, hey, Nate, do you want to go to church with me? And I said, no, I don't want to go to church with you. <laughs> and she goes, well, it's better than anything else you've been doing for a while. So why don't you give it a shot? And the truth was, is that she was right. She was very right. And so I gave it a shot. And so I went with her to a place called Rust City Church in Niles, Ohio. And it wasn't like any other church that I had experienced before. The music was a little bit louder. The messages were a little bit shorter and relevant to my life. And I'll tell you, I was a super messy person at that time. But there were some people that were willing to get messy with me. And it was really cool because I started to experience this relationship with God that I had never really understood before. 
you see, my version of God was, is he was just waiting for me to, to mess up. And as soon as I did, he was going to punish me and I was going to be in trouble. And so now we're talking about a God who wants nothing more than just to have a relationship with me. This really started, started to open me up spiritually. And the crazy part was, is that I understood that God forgave me. But now because of that forgiveness, now I had to go on the journey of learning how to forgive myself. And so enter in Brad. And Brad was actually a pastor of this church. And he comes into my life and he really starts to encourage me. And he invites me out to coffee and we spend some time together. I asked him just point blankly because, I mean, rewind to the part where I said I wanted to become the best version of me in all areas. I was seeking out mentors in different areas of my life. So I wanted a, a, a health mentor. I wanted a, a, a financial mentor. And spiritually, I wanted somebody to mentor me on this new journey that I was taking. He took that job very seriously. And we're meeting together once a week. And he was encouraging me, but he was giving me hard truths, which are so important. A hard truth from a person that you can trust is really important in you developing. And I'll tell you, a good mentor will take you places that you desperately need to go, that you have no desire to go on your own. And so he would push and prod in different areas of my life that I needed pushed and prodded on. And because of that, it forced me to look at my life in a way that I didn't want to. Naturally, we want to seek comfort as human beings. We constantly are looking for comfort. And he was excellent at helping me navigate. Yes, it's okay to be comfort, but you also need to learn, hey, here's the ugly areas of me too. If I don't face those ugly areas, they're never going to change. Yeah, that reminds me of your Instagram post you posted maybe last week, the, the four questions that shaped your life. And the one that really impacted me out of those four was, what harsh truths do you prefer to ignore? And I sat, I, I sat on that one for a minute. And I said, dang, that's a great question. <laughs> well, absolutely. And, and it's, it's not because we're bad people. It's really not. None of us are when it comes to that. We just are wired to say, am I okay right now? And if I am, then I don't need to look at the ugliness of my life. Nothing can be healed if it isn't first revealed. Mm -hmm. And so I want to actually be a person that says, I'm going to look into the darkness because I know I'm strong enough, first of all. I know that I will overcome it. But once I've looked into that darkness, now I have the ability to bring that into the light and I can experience healing from it. I'm going to take a moment to summarize some of the things that I heard or learned from you, just because I hope the audience is here with us. I mean, I think a few great things that you did. A, you called your old, old employer, the landscaper. That just gave you something to be consistent with in life. Love that. B, you got exposed to personal development after getting some motivation, took the next step and started thinking strategy. Three, you've got the right people surrounding you. And, and I want you to expand on this, but I love the line that you say, you need friends that know you and know you. Oh, that's great. And then this last piece, and, and you can touch on the, the other one that we talked about, but also I want to talk on this piece. You start to repair some of the damage that you've done in the past. Yeah. And I loved the story about when you called this lady that borrowed your car. I just thought, wow, it, it, I could feel the awkwardness or the stumbling that that step took, but I felt like it was really, really important to you. Yeah. So when it comes to having the right voices in your life, they're always going to help you make the right choices in your life. And so I need two types of people in my life. I need people that will know, K-N-O-W, know me. They know what I've been through. They know what I've experienced. They know what I should stay away from. And then I need people that will know me. N-O, know me. No, Nate, you shouldn't send that text. No, Nate, that resentment doesn't look good on you. No, Nate, that's not where you should be this late at night. And so I need both types of people, people who can know, can empathize with where I've been, but also people who are willing to say the things to me that I desperately need to hear. You know, oftentimes our friends, we just want to be friends with people, right? So that means that we want to comfort people. We want to love people. We, want to, we don't want to see our friends in pain. But I'll tell you, I need friends in my life who are more interested and committed to me as a person than me as a friend, which means that they will say the things that I need to hear, even if it means I might be mad at them. I might tell them, no, dude, you're, you're crazy. What are you talking about? Or it might jeopardize our friendship. I need both types of people in my life. And so through that, I was really encouraged and empowered to start to repair some of the damage of my past. And part of that meant, 
calling people who I had no desire to call because I didn't know where this conversation was going to go. And it was uncomfortable and it was painful. And I didn't, you know, there, there's so much fear of the unknown, right? We don't know what they're going to say. We don't know how they're going to take it. We don't know what hard truths they're going to give us. There's so much freedom on the other side of it too. And so I was really proud of myself in that moment because I faced, I looked fear in the face. I said, you're not going to win today. You're not going to beat me today. Mm. I can't promise you tomorrow I'm going to win, but for today, I'm overcoming this. And I made a phone call to a lady who had let me borrow her car for a really long time. And the crazy part was, is I was using it to go back and forth to the casinos. And this is when I didn't have one. There was actually toll roads that cost money that you had to pay to go through on the highway. But there was this easy pass lane that if you had one of those easy passes, they just took a picture of your car and you would go through it. Well, I breezed through this easy pass with n- lane with no easy pass at all. And so they take a picture of a car. They sent her, uh, and I d- did this several times. They sent her a huge bill. She ended up having to fork over all this money. And so I had to call this lady and essentially apologize like, hey, who I was is not who I am now. I made some ma- mistakes in my life, but I'm, I'm also trying to become a new me. She took it really well, man. Like in the beginning, she, she laid into me a little bit. She really gave it to me. As she should. Which, <laughs> which I deserved. I 100% deserved. But then I, I think that ultimately people want to see the good in other people. And she saw that I was trying and she recognized that. And she really gave me some really cool, encouraging words in that moment. And I'm super thankful because that was a, that was a moment for me that I then capitalized on and used to create momentum to start to repair the damage in my past in other areas as well. Speaking of another relationship, where do you currently stand with your former business partner? (laughs) This is the hot topic right now. So as of right now, as of today, we still have not yet repaired our relationship. I keep having this vision that one day I write him a check for $10,000 and just say, I'm sorry. But until then, I'm, I'm just believing that, you know, when he's ready, we'll be able to have those conversations. He's just not ready yet. And I'll be honest with you. I don't blame him. I don't resent him at all. I gave him every single reason why he shouldn't want to be around me. But I'll also tell you that there are people that know a version of you that doesn't exist anymore. And so there's people from your past who will look at that past version of you and hold that against you still. And I'm just here to say that's okay. That's okay. It's it's, it's not their fault. It's actually our fault. And so what I'm just choosing to do is I'm choosing to have grace. I'm just choosing to believe that says one day it will happen. Our our relationship will be repaired. But until then, I'm just going to make sure that my side of the street is clean so that when he's ready, I can be prepared to make the right amends. That's tough. I couldn't imagine having to be patient and understanding in that situation because as you mentioned, he knows who you were and you know who you are now. And that's a really, really challenging position to be in. Yeah, no doubt, man. But it's it's also got me something to continue to work towards. Mm. So I I don't want to give up. I don't want to slow down. I'm going to continue to build my life back brick by brick. There's something beautiful about being at the bottom, by the way. If if you're experiencing a bottom moment in your life, There's something really beautiful about where you're at because you get to now be the architect of the life that you've always wanted. And so I'm just choosing to say that I'm building my life back. I'm working hard. I'm getting uncomfortable. I'm having the hard moments, but I'm not giving up because giving up never got us anywhere that we wanted to go. So this time we're choosing, we're not going to quit. We're going to keep moving forward and we're going to see this thing through to the end. Mm. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Let's pick up your story where you left off. Yeah. I, I think a good a spot you deposited us was, was probably Rust City College. Where are you at now? And, and you know, where have you come from since that point in time? Yeah. So I went through Rust City College a two year. It was a two year ministry program that taught me how to lead people, how to effectively communicate my message. It, it taught me discipline, consistency, all these really great utility skill sets that I now have. And fast forward, you know, I met the love of my life while I was there. She was on stage singing. I fell in love with her beautiful voice. And we got married last year, which was absolutely amazing. We got married in the middle of 2020. We, we couldn't wait. We couldn't resist ourselves. We had, to get it, we had to get married right away. We bought our first investment property. So we own a duplex. We are house hacking right now. So we live in one side and we're renting out the other. We're actually looking at acquiring a second property here very soon. 
I sat on the board of a nonprofit for underprivileged youth. I get to lead hundreds of volunteers at my local church. And for the last 18 months, I've been working on a project to help people who feel like their life is too messy to change, who feel like, man, I've never created a vision for my future, or, or I feel like there's something inside of me and I just don't know how to go to that next level. And it's the book called You'll Never Change that I wrote. And it, it came out June 1st. It went to number one in Amazon, which was a really cool experience. And I've gotten to, to be on several different podcasts and I get to meet very interesting people just like yourself. And I am, you know, I'm just a chubby kid from Ohio who's made a whole lot of mistakes. Tony Robbins says, uh, it's a great quote. He says that problems can be our greatest gifts if we choose to grow from them. That's a big if. And so I've just said, I am choosing to grow from every single mistake that I've ever made. And I want to see where this thing takes me. Mm, Badass. So what do you hope someone that picks up your book takes away from it? Yeah, who you were is not who you are. Mm. And just because you've made some mistakes in your past, it does not mean that you are one. Progress looks different on every single person. So please, please do not give up on the person that you are becoming. Mm. I love that. So Nate, we're going to wrap things up here. But before I ask my final question here, people can find your book on Amazon. You also ask people to check out your website, you'llneverchange.com. And you also have a really cool program, a pay it forward program. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So one of the cool things that I get to do now is I partner with different rehab and recovery facilities where I'll go in and I'll share my story. I love to be able to give this book away completely for free to every single person that I meet in there. And the way that I do that is that I've, I've developed this pay it forward initiative where somebody can buy a book at a discounted rate for another human being that they've never met before in their life. And when I hand these books out to these guys and girls, I say, this is not a gift from me. This is a gift from someone that's never met you, but who believes in you, believes in your story, believes in your comeback and wants the best for you. And you should see it's, it is actually really cool. Uh, this guy named Craig who read the book, he said, when I read it, I read it with tears in my eyes because I felt like for the very first time, someone understood what I was going through. And so if you'd like to partner with me, if you'd like to buy a book for someone and pay it forward, you can go to you'llneverchange.com slash pay it forward. It's awesome. So my final question for you, Nate, if you had the opportunity to teach a 16-week class to a group of graduating seniors, On a topic that isn't normally covered in the classroom, what would you teach and how would you teach it? So I would talk about gratitude. And so before we write this off as just another gratitude list or like, here we go, attitude of gratitude, here it is, just hear me out. Gratitude reminds us that what we are is enough and what we have is enough. And so I just want you to understand that whatever you're going through right now, it is not forever. It is not eternal. There's no emotion that lasts forever. The only thing that is eternal is our souls. And so through gratitude, I would remind every single one of us that you can't be grateful and angry at the same time. You can't be grateful and resentful at the same time. You can't be grateful and envious at the same time. So if you want to hack your way into becoming the best version of you, start to cultivate gratitude. And literally the first 15, 20 minutes of class every single day, we would do what I do every day, which is I intentionally sit down, put headphones in, I begin to meditate and I cultivate my own version of gratitude. And I just focus on things that I've been through, experiences that I've had, the things that I want to do. And I remind myself that what I have is enough but more importantly, that I am enough. Nate, man, it has been a pleasure. I so enjoyed reading the book. Super excited to see the impact that you're going to continue to make on this world. Super excited to stay connected with you. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Dude, you are amazing. This podcast, this is just the beginning for it. I really do believe that this is just the beginning for what you're going to do. So you have my full support and I can't wait to see where it goes. Thanks for listening to the episode. As always, I appreciate your kind words. If you want to leave us a rating and review on your podcast player right now, that would absolutely make my day. If you want to find episode show notes, our blog, and other great resources, head over to tsirpodcast.com. 
If you have follow-up questions, an idea for a future episode, or just want to say hi, we have a contact form on our website and those messages go straight into my inbox and I promise you, I will reply. But all right, guys, I really appreciate you tuning in. I love you all and you're not alone. Let's keep making it through our struggles together. Mm-hmm.